Hello and welcome to Point of View Podcasts, a series of conversations from Kaufman Hall & Associates about the challenges and opportunities now facing hospitals and healthcare systems. As a value-based business model emerges, accelerated by new healthcare reform regulations, organizations must ensure that their financial planning takes into account the specific effects of reform-related changes. To talk about how hospitals and health systems can reliably predict and prepare for utilization and payment shifts, we're joined by Dawn Samaris, Senior Vice President at Kaufman Hall and a member of the firm's strategic financial planning practice. Dawn, healthcare reform has many facets to it. Which ones are those that we really want to focus on when it comes to financial planning? We're in a period of very significant change currently in, in health care. And organizations, while doing their financial planning most as accurately as possible, determine what the effect of payment and care delivery changes are going to be on their organization over the next five to ten years. Organizations need to understand their, their current positioning and based on their point of view of where the industry is headed, where they need to go, and whether they have the resources internally to be able to achieve their objectives. Modeling the impact of healthcare reform and market forces are critical in this endeavor. So in planning for these changes, then, how might volume specifically be affected? This is an area of significant debate, and, and Kaufman Hall's view is that volume is likely to actually decline on, on the inpatient and outpatient side. While there may be some increases on the outpatient side, especially in the physician practice area, there are other forces at work that are likely to drive down volume over the longer term. While there are individuals who are gaining insurance coverage, the exchanges and the expansion of Medicaid, there is a lot of downward pressure on volume in other areas, especially in the commercial area, with additional deductibles and copays that are being pushed to patients and affecting their health care decisions going forward. There's also an increase focused on quality and avoiding readmissions by both the government and commercial payers. What have we already seen happen in trends in utilization? We've seen very significant declines, especially on the inpatient side, which is easier to get our arms around the, the magnitude of the change. We did a 20-state study of the history of utilization on the inpatient side. A large number of states have been seeing declines in inpatient utilization. This is really driven by the large regional players looking to position themselves for narrower networks and value-based contracts with their payers and proving that they are able to manage care in such a way that they are providing real value and really truly driving utilization out of the system. On the outpatient side, many of the commercial payers are looking very closely at how they will be able to work with hospitals and physicians to drive down imaging and other high cost outpatient activity that in all, many cases is viewed as unnecessary. How might the expanding presence of narrow networks and large regional players affect utilization? Well, in order to establish a narrow network, really the larger organizations are those that are successful in establishing these. The large regional players need to work with their payers to determine ways to really reduce utilization and reduce costs to such an extent that the payer is motivated to direct additional volume to them in exchange for lower costs. In several urban markets, we've seen very significant declines in utilizations as the regional players position themselves for success in this environment. The reduction in cost needs to be in the area of 20 to 25 percent, and the regional players are making up this reduced utilization through additional steerage of volume to them by the payers. This leaves those who are outside of the narrow networks very vulnerable to large reductions in utilization through changes in care patterns by the physician networks in those areas without any upside from additional payments through value-based agreements or shared savings. So given these potential volume changes, how then do organizations project their capacity and capital needs? Given the uncertainty in the environment, scenario modeling will be key. Organizations should clearly define their credit goals and understand how different volume and payment scenarios will impact their ability to reach these goals and the levels of performance improvement that may be required. When we talk about scenario modeling, a lot of our focus is on the risk areas the organization are fa is facing. 
So how, as we change different assumptions, how the results change and how the cr overall credit profile of the organization is impacted. Another big change that organizations can expect is in their payer mix. What do you anticipate happening there? The first and most straightforward impact is going to be driven by the aging of the population. This is fairly straightforward to model and looking demographically at how your population changes over the next five to 10 years, you can project out how much of my commercial base today is going to flip over to be Medicare over the next few years. When we look at this analysis, typically the rate of change from commercial patients to Medicare is at about one to two percent a year. What about the expanding population of people who will be insured through both Medicaid and the exchanges? Assuming all states participate in the Medicaid expansion, nationwide the uninsured population should fall by about two-thirds, and about 50 percent of the newly insured will be covered by Medicaid and 50% by the exchanges. Of course, the recent Supreme Court decision cast doubt on these numbers as some states now say they will not participate in the exchanges. The nationwide figures are helpful, but they should be adjusted by the particulars in your area. Looking specifically at the percentage of uninsured who are illegal immigrants, the percentage who are below 133% of the federal poverty limit, all these types of things very much change the dynamics of how the uninsured population is likely to become insured going forward. A second item is movement of currently in commercially insured individuals into exchange products, and an estimate of those who will qualify for the exchanges and remain uninsured and pay the penalty instead. Estimates are sometimes pretty high, but this is an area of, of significant controversy and, and disagreement. So you mentioned it might be difficult to estimate um, the impact of people who shift from commercial insurance to the exchanges. Can you elaborate a bit about that? There's a lot of debate about how many people will shift from traditional commercial insurance to the exchange products. And I've seen estimates between about 2 to 40% of the commercially insured likely to shift over to exchange products. The CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, is very much estimating this to be at the lower end of, the, of that range. In Massachusetts, which is our best example, but admittedly different than the rest of the country, very few people actually shifted from traditional commercial insurance to the exchanges. This is a matter of controversy and debate, and we often include a sensitivity analysis around the magnitude of this shift. The other big question then is, how do we predict what the exchanges will reimburse? The exchanges are likely to reimburse well below traditional commercial insurance. Most people estimate that the in exchanges are likely to reimburse at approximately Medicare rates. Our experience in California and Massachusetts with their established exchanges is that people tend to choose the bronze plans, which are the lowest cost plans, and reimburse near Medicare levels. And this obviously has implications for hospitals and their planning going forward because a portion of their commercial insurance is likely to move down to this lower Medicare rate. How do these shifts in demographics and insurance coverage relate to bad debt and disproportionate share hospital payments? Let me start with the projected decrease in bad debt. This is somewhat complicated because while bad debt is likely to go down with people becoming newly insured, so folks that were previously self-pay will no longer have as large of a bad debt burden, these new exchange products and to a large degree, commercial insurance products are pushing much more of the burden of payment onto patients. So deductibles, co-pays, and the responsibility of the individual is in a lot of cases going up, which is likely to put the hospital at risk for actual increases in bad debt, which is likely in a large degree to offset the benefit of having the newly insured. The dish reductions are hard to estimate in a lot of detail currently. We know overall that there will be reductions in dish, but that a large portion of, of the pool will be redistributed out to hospitals, but the formula for this has not yet been established. But it is important for hospitals to understand their exposure to reductions in dish and how this will impact their revenue stream going forward. Health reform also includes quality incentives and disincentives. How much of an impact might these have? 
the impact of the quality incentives on the governmental side are relatively moderate currently. The Medicare penalty for excess readmissions is currently at 1%, and that will grow to 3% by 2015. Value-based purchasing incentives and penalties are modest for most organizations currently, but these are expected to grow over time on the Medicare side. Perhaps the more significant quality impact is likely to come from the commercial insurance side. Many commercial insurers we're hearing are telling hospitals that they can't rely on the traditional increases that they've been seeing, that increases going forward will very much be tied to quality and the ability to demonstrate value much more so than a typical inflationary increase. Should organizations be thinking about managing at Medicare levels across the board? The reality is that most hospitals are very far from managing at this level. When, when we do the analysis for most hospitals, there's a very significant gap in their cost base and managing to Medicare levels. That being said, it is an important analysis to do and really understand your exposure and understand the magnitude of change that may be required. We don't think that this is something that is going to happen in the next one to five years, but over a long term, organizations should understand how they may need to change their model to get close to those levels. That was Don Samaras, Senior Vice President at Kaufman Hall and a member of the firm's strategic financial planning practice. To hear more in our podcast series, go to kaufmanhall.com.